These were common. height restrictions and requirements for a new subway entrance relocation. MANA products text amendment in Council Member Van Bramer's district. Uh, it's going to be an enlargement of an existing building and the residential voids text amendment will modify existing bulk regulations for residential buildings in certain districts. The council is going to be modifying the application to restore a 25 foot height threshold for establishing whether buildings enclosed uh, mechanical spaces could be counted as zoning floor area and the Department of City Planning has agreed to study additional and pursue follow-up actions. Moving on, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. First, in honor of our veterans following Memorial Day, the council will vote on Councilmember Chaim Deutsch's uh, bill introduction 1047A, which would require the Department of Veterans Services to coordinate with the Department of Consumer Affairs and other agencies to establish outreach and engagement efforts that educate student veterans on financial issues and resources related to higher education. The Department of Veterans Services would also be required to post any materials developed on the department's website and make them available in each veterans resource center. Uh, Councilmember Deutsch isn't here. Uh, next, introduction 1180A, sponsored by Councilmember uh, Diana Ayala, will require each caseworker providing services at a Difter Senior Center to complete a mental health training course in older adults offered by the Department of Health and a refresher course at least once every three years. Uh, and we're going to have a few bills pertaining to physical education. Introduction 242B, sponsored by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, would require the Department of Education to provide a report on after-school athletic funding to the council and post the data on the DOE's website. The report would include data with respect to the funding for coaches, referees, athletic directors, equipment, uniforms, and transportation. And the bill would require reporting on student demographic information, athletic uh, teams' requests, and athletic facilities used for for after school athletics and also resolution 85 also sponsored by Councilman Reynoso calls upon the New York City Department of Education to ensure that all students have equitable access to after school athletic activities and associated funding. Uh, we are joined by Councilmember Drum, Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Rivera, and Councilmember Rodriguez. Introduction 1294A, sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal, would amend Local Law 102 of 2015 to require additional reporting on whether students with disabilities are provided with adaptive physical education, including the number of students receiving each of these options per individual school. The bill would also require a summary of key findings in the report issued by DOE and whether the department is in compliance with state physical education requirements. And I invite Councilmember Rosenthal up to discuss her bill. Thank you so much to Speaker Johnson and to his whole team for helping to shine a spotlight. Um, I'm so pleased that the council will be voting today on my legislation which holds New York City public schools more accountable for ensuring that students with physical disabilities receive adaptive physical education. Our school system has a fundamental obligation to ensure that every child, including those with disabilities, receives the required amount of physical education. It's critical for every child's overall health and well-being. But the Department of Education's lack of data on adaptive PE compliance means that resources are not well placed and students with disabilities are slipping through the cracks. The DOE is not complying with the current requirement that they report on the number of students who have already been um, identified as needing adaptive physical education, and there's no information on who is, exact, who is actually receiving the services that they are entitled to receive. My legislation pushes the Department of Education harder and farther. They must now report on the number of students who are receiving adaptive PE at each school and schools not in compliance must provide the specific steps they will be taking in order to get to the place where they can provide uh, adaptive PE. Let's be clear, access to PE is a problem for students across our public schools. 
just over half of K through 12th grade students are receiving the legally required amount of PE education. This is unacceptable and will continue to shine a spotlight on the DOE until, the, uh, until every child has full access to physical education. I want to thank the Committee on Education staff, including Malcolm Butehorn, Jan Atwell, as well as my staff, Ned Terra, Sarah Crean, and Marisa Mock for their work on this bill. We look forward to getting the legislation passed later today. Thank you so much, Speaker thank Johnson. You. Thanks, Ellen. Congratulations. Uh, Council Moreno so, uh, is here now, and he's going to speak on Introduction 242 on requiring DOE to report on uh, sports and athletics, and also Resolution 85 on the DOE ensuring that all schools have equitable access to after school athletic activities. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson for his support and uh, these bills moving forward. I also want to thank uh, Councilmember Danny Drum, who is a, a great partner in the work we were doing in the last term in trying to bring this issue to the forefront. Uh, one of the first pieces of legislation that I passed was uh, uh, legislation to get data on guidance counselors. Um, I was trying to push for 250, for every 250 students that there be a guidance counselor in schools. Uh, but what we found is that the Department of Education didn't have any data or information as to how many guidance counselors were in the system and where exactly they were working and what exactly they were doing. Uh, but after that legislation was passed and one year went through and we got the reporting, they opened up a office of guidance counselors. Um, and now the results that you're seeing related to support services in these schools um, has made a great impact on the students of the city of New York. That is the exact same thing we're trying to do here. We have no information related to how exactly sports teams in these schools are being doled out. So what we're asking now is for the Department of Education to give us that information, give us that data, so we can make a proper assessment of who is, is, is benefiting from sports uh, in our schools and who is not. Once we have that data, we can make, uh, we can make better decisions. Um, and uh, what's currently happening um, is that we have inequities in schools, smaller schools. And smaller schools uh, tend to be schools that um, have larger black and brown populations. Um, so. Um, I want to say there's some level of discrimination happening that I think is institutional in this case that needs to be looked at. Carranza has talked a lot about wanting to break uh, the school to prison pipeline and the racial disparities that are happening in our schools. This is, I think, within the ballpark of one of those issues that we need to solve for. So I want to thank again everyone that is supportive of the legislation. I'm looking forward um, to revising uh, this uh, uh, sports equity issue um, so that we can get justice for all. Thank you. Thanks. Grazie, Antonio. Uh, next up is introduction 1298A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, our education chair, and it will require the DOE to report on physical education curricula in New York City schools, including average physical education class size, a description of the department's physical education scope and sequence, including the topics covered by such physical education scope and sequence, and the bill would additionally require reporting on professional development received by certified education instructors physical education instructors. Uh, next is resolution 811 sponsored by council member Danique Miller and it calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to require inclusion of employee protection provisions in all current and future school bus contracts in New York City. EPPs require school transportation contractors among other things to give priority in hiring to employees who became unemployed because of their employer's loss of a DOE bus contract and to pay such employees the same wages and benefits they had received prior to becoming unemployed. Next is introduction 342A, sponsored by Councilmember Debbie Rose, and it will require that building owners who provide portable ramps for access to their buildings post a sign at each inaccessible entrance stating that a portable ramp is available and the phone number to request use of a ramp. It will also establish requirements for portable ramps to ensure their safety and utility. Accessibility is a major, major issue in our city, and I know this bill will make it easier for people to get in and out of buildings. Sometimes people don't know that a ramp is available or how to get one, so I applaud Council Member Rose for her efforts here and passage of this bill, and I invite her to come up and speak on it. Thank you, Speaker. Everybody knows that accessibility is an issue. Accessibility to our transportation, to our buildings, to our schools. And so intro 342A would require that a sign be posted at inaccessible building entrances, indicating that a portable ramp is available when such a ramp exists. 
while creating a permanent means of access to all of the buildings in New York City is the goal, we know that that is not immediately possible. The 2008 building code requires that all public entrances of new buildings and newly renovated buildings will be permanently accessible to persons with physical disabilities. The ADA also requires that a building is made accessible to persons with physical disabilities during an active renovation. I know this because I've had knee surgery and it's been very difficult to access city buildings. This bill will ensure that our constituents know that an accessibility ramp is available for them, that they will have a number that they can call to request that the ramp is placed out so that it becomes accessible. And more importantly, they know that they can safely gain access to the building at any time. The bill will also establish the safety standards for the ramps to prevent accidents in the future. This is just another measure that will make it easier for persons with a disability to access the buildings without worry or concern for their safety. This is a win-win for all of us, including the um, disability community and those who are of us who are temporarily disabled. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. Congratulations. Uh, I'm excited to say we're going to be voting on two bills focused on transforming our city streets, making our streets safer, and breaking the car culture is something we've been working on for a while now, and I'm proud that we have an opportunity to, fill, to fulfill this commitment uh, for our fellow New Yorkers. Uh, introduction 1163A, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, would require holders of the Department of Transportation permits, holders of the Department of Transportation permits for work on a street or intersection that is a bike lane to to maintain a temporary bike lane. This legislation also requires that the Department of Transportation must provide notice to affected council members, borough presidents, and the district manager of the affected community board upon approval of a permit for work affecting a street segment or intersection with a bike lane. And I want to invite Councilman Rivera up on this important bill. Thank you. I want to thank you, Speaker Johnson, and of course, the Transportation Committee, Cherry Donis Rodriguez, who you're going to hear from in a minute, and all of the council members who today are going to vote on two bills that I really do feel make us feel better in our own neighborhoods and, and really produce safer streets for all. So it is National Bike Month, and I think it's important that we close out the month taking real action to make bicycling safer on our streets. The bill being voted on today, Intro 1163, requires that the permits issued by the Department of Transportation for on-street construction include rules for the maintenance and protection of bike lanes. It also requires that DOT provide notice of any work affecting a bicycle lane to the affected community board and elected officials. I feel this is incredibly important because they are many times our frontline groups and organizations, and they are always um, looking for more information on how to update constituents who call. So before today, DOT's construction permit stipulations for bike lanes had not been updated in over 10 years. If you've been anywhere in my district or anywhere in the city, you know that large-scale construction projects have become an unfortunate part of life. And when construction impacts a bike lane, it doesn't just inconvenience cyclists. It becomes a public safety hazard for all New Yorkers. And this is just creates a safer culture for pedestrians, motorists, and cyclists alike. I know from firsthand experience the difference this bill would make. This bill, I think like any good legislation, comes from a constituent concern and my own personal experience. From First Avenue between East 4th and East 5th Street, we had an issue there in which cyclists were forced out of the protected bike lane into the same lane as car traffic with very little notice. And you all know that First Avenue is a very busy street. And this should, shouldn't happen on any street where we can make those accommodations. And so with this new legislation, those dangerous construction sites will finally be enforced and bike lanes will remain open and protected during work. And this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for Commissioner Trottenberg and the amazing team at DOT. They realized the intent and spirit of this bill um, was good for the city and we are working to make sure that we can implement these changes as soon as feasibly possible. So I want to thank all of the advocates. As you know, we have very uh, energetic cyclist advocates in New York City, and I've worked with a, a ton of groups on this bill to make sure that we're taking care of people. And of course, the team here on, on Central Staff, you all have been amazing. And again, this bill is only addressing one part of a much larger conversation that we have to have 
about safer streets for pedestrians, for cyclists, for motorists. I'm really, really proud um, as a cyclist, as someone who chooses cycling as their um, first, first means of transit throughout her district, that we're going to make this a safer city for all. Thank you. Congratulations, Carlina. Uh, next is introduction 322A, sponsored by our great transportation committee chair, Idanis Rodriguez. And this bill has been around for a while. It's an important bill. I am so glad we're doing this today. Congratulations. It's going to require the Department of Transportation to develop a checklist of safety enhancing design elements that must be considered for all major street redesign projects. For each project with, uh, for which the checklist requirement applies, the department would be required to provide an explanation on why any safety enhancing design element was not applied. Smart street design literally saves lives and these bills will make it possible and protect many pedestrians and cyclists throughout New York City. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this effort in making our streets safer and I want to invite uh, Chair Rodriguez up to discuss this really exciting bill. Congratulations, Adonis. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker Johnson. Without it, your leadership, we know that it would be very difficult to be where we are today. It's like we holding this hearing this week also on the Heart Island. There have been discussion in the city that uh, we started with the administration saying no, no, no to a lot of things, but unless there's a leader at the council that is committed to say no, this means a lot to New Yorkers. They would not happen. So for me, this is a great day for all of us. And I would like to first thank you for uh, your leadership on this issue and many other issues in the city of New York. I would also like to thank my colleagues uh, here at the Council of Transportation and Trinity, Family for Safe Streets, and all the advocates that have worked so hard on this issue and many other issues to make our city the most walkable in the whole nation. This bill goes along with my goal and the goal of the Council and the leadership of Speaker Johnson. Uh, to make our city the most walkable pedestrians and cyclists friendly in the nation. This bill is a reflection of all the advocacy, uh, hard work we all have done to ensure we lost, we lost no other love wine to an inefficient a, 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 a street design that we have in the city of New York. It is a fact that this year, we have seen an increase in traffic-related death this year compared to 2018. Intro 322-8 will ensure that the Department of Transportation install life-saving measures and a strict element, while at the same time making, that, making more information to the public on how the city are doing those designing. The bill will mandate DOT to create a checklist to, of all the safety enhancing, enhancing street design elements the departments must consider for major transportation projects. The creation of protected bike lanes, dedicated unloading zones, pedestrian safety island, signal protected pedestrian crossing, ADA accessibility are not just there to make our streets more organized, organized but yet to make them more they are there to keep people safe from vehicles and irresponsible drivers. At Shutter Transportation Committee, and together with the speaker, we have made with this our goal to save life. I will continue to work alongside my colleague, Advocate and Speaker Johnson, to make sure we reduce the numbers of traffic-related deaths and, and crashes that, that happen in the city of New York. Thank you to all, and I know that this is important to the council, but to the whole city of New York. Gracias. Congratulations, Adonis. Uh, next. Call upon the state legislature to pass the accompanying Senate and Assembly bills, uh, which are known as the Less is More Act, which would reform parole in New York State. This legislation would restrict the use of detention for minor technical violations and would give people on parole uh, recognizance hearings uh, in criminal court prior to being detained. Councilman Powers, in your very important bill, I hope the state legislature passed this bill, really key to deepening uh, criminal justice reform in our city and our
our estate. Next is resolution 143A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, uh, would call on the uh, legislature to pass the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solitary Confinement, also known as the HALT Act. This legislation would limit the amount of time that a person could spend outside of the general jail population to 15 days. It would also require local and state facilities to develop residential rehabilitation units to replace solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, I believe, is torture, and we need to reform it, and I'm really grateful that Danny has led on this, not just as this resolution, he has led on these issues for years and years and years. Long before people were talking about criminal justice reform, Danny Drum was visiting Rikers Island uh, unannounced, pushing for more humane treatment of people who are detained, so I'm proud to call him up today on passage of this. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and yes, the first time I ever visited Rikers Island, I was shocked to see 16-year-old kid in the room like from this doorway over to here, you know, eight by 10. Imagine being stuck in an eight by 10 cell 24 seven. It was absolutely unbelievable to see that with my own eyes. Uh, with the previous speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, and of course with the support of this speaker, we have done a lot to change that situation, although the situation still exists in some instances on Rikers Island. The Department of Correction oftentimes does ask for variances to the rules to extend solitary for more than 15 days, and that's an issue we're still working on within the, um, c within the Committee on Criminal Justice. This piece of legislation, this um, resolution that we're passing today, deals with it on a state level, and it still occurs on a regular basis on the state level. And as the Speaker has mentioned, the United Nations considered solitary confinement torture. And how do we allow torture to go on in our state? How do we allow that to continue in our state? It is wrong and it is not right. I recently went to visit a friend at Fishkill Correctional Facility in upstate New York, and all of a sudden the whistles blew, the um, corrections officers demanded that people stand up, and what was it for? It was because one of the inmates had in his possession his girlfriend's license and, and some cash. When I asked my friend what happened to that young person, who was about 19 years old, uh, they put him into solitary confinement for 30 days for the possession of that stuff. Now, it's illegal, and they're not supposed to have that stuff. It is contraband in there. But there are other alternatives, and that's why this piece of legislation, um, HALT legislation, um, humane alternatives to long-term solitary confinement is called what it is because there are alternatives to putting people into solitary confinement. Solitary confinement only makes people worse, mm -hmm. and when people come out of prison after they've been in solitary, sometimes on the state level, for one, two, three, four, five, or more years, they're coming back into society after having experienced that long-term solitary confinement with much more uh, deeper uh, mental illnesses than they had when they first went in. So we need to call an end to solitary confinement on the state level, and I'm really grateful to the speaker for allowing this resolution to pass here today in the council. Thank you very much. Congrats, Danny. Uh, and lastly, in honor of Memorial Day, which we know just passed in the 70, 75th anniversary of D-Day, which will be next week, Resolution 844, sponsored by Council Member for today's agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes, and I'm happy to first take any on-topic <coughs> questions for the members who have pieces of legislation today. Anything on-topic? Um, Vin, yeah. uh, For uh, Councilwoman Rivera, do you, were you looking at the old stipulations for that bike lane bill? What, what ways did the old stipulations kind of fail to do what we're doing today in terms of securing those bike lanes? Well, I think you know, when it... It hadn't, as I mentioned before, it hadn't been updated in over 10 years. And so when you're throughout the city, it was a lot of discretion left up to some of the developers and some of the construction sites. So you saw some good examples of people trying, but in order to really make sure that this was taking place at every single site, codifying it and mandating it, and DOT is on board, and they said they're going to implement these changes as soon as possible. And it's also up to us as council members to make sure that we are staying on top of some of those construction sites and making sure that they, if they are repeat offenders, that we could revoke and put a stop work order. Gotcha. And there's, there's that language that says when feasible. Are you worried that that 
that creates a little bit too much wiggle room for developers to get out of doing this? No, no. Um, I say that because as soon as the mayor signs it, it'll go into law. And what I appreciated on behalf of the Department of Transportation was that they saw the bill. They said, we'd like to start doing this right away. And we're really working together to make sure that it happens immediately. Thanks. Anything else? Yes, on topic. Yeah. Speaker, uh, talking about the master plan bill for the design that you're introducing today. Yes, 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 today. yes. Hundred would be great. We can do more than fifty. I'm on board. Uh, we worked on this bill for a while. Um, I, as you know, from my State of the City address and from the passage of these two bills today and many of the other bills we've done, I am deeply committed to uh, more bike lanes in New York City. I think I, I, I might have more bike lanes than anyone else in my district that I've been supportive of all of them. So um, I don't know how we arrived at that exact number. I'm happy to do more. Uh, it's a target. It's a goal. We're going to keep pushing. I think it's important for all the reasons that I've enumerated uh, in the past. I don't think we're at odds. We have a great relationship working together uh, on these issues. And if there's a way for us to look at this and go even further, I'm totally open to that. I'm excited by the two bills we're passing today, which is going to protect cyclists. And I'm excited to finally pass this bill to introduce this bill on a master plan and as it goes through the legislative process if uh, we should go further we'll go further I'm open to that not close-minded to it at all anyone thing else on topic uh, Mark did you want to speak on on your you had something on physical education Are you okay I, I'm okay with just to wanna two seconds just because it's sure. really important sure. thank the speaker very very quickly and all my colleagues uh, we're passing, we're advancing a package of equity bills, and I thank the speaker and his great staff for helping us advance these bills. We learned there are over 200,000 students in our school system, mostly in elementary school, mostly communities of color, are not getting the required physical education uh, time in our school system, which is outrageous. Uh, this is not just about, this is also about social emotional learning, building, building positive relationships for, for our kids. Uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Rosenthal, has a fantastic bill about making sure that uh, accommodations are made for all of our students. Um, and so kudos to Councilman Reynoso, Rosenthal, and all of my colleagues and speaker. Thank you for this advancing equity in our school system. Thanks. That's it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you have, yeah. Um, just a uh, clarification question on the property tax exemption. I, I just don't yep. know much about that issue. Do, do all affordable uh, developments get property tax exemptions, or, or how are these no. collected? Or are these it's it's case by case for every building I believe the ones that we talked about today are article 11 property tax exemptions which is a, a program that's set up where if you do a certain level of affordability for a certain number of years you get a property tax exemption for keeping those units affordable in the building we do a lot of for preserving the sort of case by case on these buildings, but it's a certain program and the requirements for Article 11 property tax exemptions, I don't know, I apologize, all of them off the top of my head, uh, but there are requirements that you would need to abide by to be accepted into that program and to even get it here all of the ones that make it to us have gone to HPD first. So HPD has uh, met with the developer, worked on the application, made sure it has met the requirements. Then HPD typically comes to the council member, at least in my district. They come to me. They say, are you OK with uh, extending or renewing this Article 11 property tax exemption? Then when we say yes, the individual council member, HPD then brings the proposal to the council for formal review through the committee process process. That's typically how it works. Any other on topic questions? Okay, off topic. Joe. I was wondering if you have any updates on budget stuff. Did you get any of the updated revenue uh, for that? We talked about we're going to increase beyond what we said in the hearings, and then do you have any back and forth about getting committed to your priorities? Is anyone from finance here? No? Okay, hopefully I don't screw this up. Um, so, uh, and Danny, jump in. If I, if, I, if, if I say something wrong, our finance chair, uh, who co-leads BNT with me. Um, 
So we believe that the personal income tax money for uh, the month of April came in significantly higher than was initially projected in the preliminary budget and even at the start, I believe, of the executive budget hearings. And we think that is over $400 million, I believe, higher than what was projected and what we've seen so far. Latanya, the pit money for April was $400 million higher than expected? About that. So um, that's just sort of factual. I mean, that's, there's no contention on that. That's just revenue that's come in. So that's not even a forecasting. The real issue now comes down to a forecasting from where we go now through the end of the fiscal year, from now to July 1st, on what the additional personal income tax money is, the additional property tax revenue money is, the additional unincorporated business tax money is, all the different revenue pools that we take in, how does that add up? And there is a disagreement at this point between uh, the Office of Management and Budget and the City Council. The Comptroller released uh, revenue projection numbers, forecasting, and our numbers are literally almost exactly in line. I think they're just $1 million off of where the Comptroller's numbers are. Uh, IBO, the Independent Budgets Office numbers, their numbers are lower than our numbers, the Comptroller and the Council. We can get you the exact numbers, Joe, so you have them. But uh, IBO is lower than the Council and Comptroller. We're the same. OMB is lower than us, the Comptroller. IBO, they're way low. So we have to figure out, based off of revenue estimates that are going to come in for uh, when we're finishing up uh, May in the next week, what were the revenue projections, what were the actual revenue numbers for May, and what's going to happen leading in to the month of June towards the end of the fiscal year on all of those different revenue streams and tax uh, um, taxing uh, mechanisms that we collect money from, that's where we are right now. And so part of our budget negotiations, based on what was in our preliminary budget response, will depend on where we arrive in uh, negotiations on what that final number should look like. Rich. I, I honestly don't know anything about it. Um, where? Oh, sorry, I wasn't there. Um, I, I, I've gotten in trouble in the past by commenting on bills that I don't know the specifics on, so I'm a little hesitant uh, to do so. But I do think what it speaks to is uh, the gentrification and displacement that we've seen throughout our entire city, all five boroughs, that anxiety, that fear, especially amongst long-term residents about what's happening to them. You see uh, 58,000 people sleeping in the shelter system. You see over 100,000 students who are unstably housed throughout the course of a school year. Uh, and that, I think, has led to uh, communities, especially uh, communities of color, that have felt like the, uh, the ramifications of gentrification uh, have not uh, been positive on those communities. I know nothing about the study. It will go through the legislative process. I'm happy to look at it and get you an exact statement. Yeah, I th and, and I, I don't know the exact mechanism. If it, we need to do it as a bill, if it has to, if it's involved in land use, land use stuff, we can't change. That can only be changed through charter. So, um, and I don't think the Charter Revision Commission is looking at this. So maybe there's a way to include. I don't know what the legislation says. If they want to do a study simultaneously when something's moving through the land use process, but I have to look at it. I'd like to read it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, Summer. I think when we talk about rezonings, they need to be done in a community-based planning type way, which means that the, they're, they're not always um, uh, determinative, but recommendations from the community board and borough president matter, and they need to weigh on what the final uh, disposition of a land use action looks like. So that always has to be part of the process. I always am very communicative and symbiotic in some ways with the local community boards in my district when a land use action is moving through the process. Not always, but most of the time. Um, again, I don't want to comment on what 
uh, the public advocate said without knowing what he said in full. Um, I would have, need to see his full comments to be able to comment it in a fair way. Uh, but I think what you've seen across the city is real fear based off of uh, some of the rezonings that have happened. Because when we talk about affordable housing, the real question is affordable to who? And many people feel like the affordable housing that's constructed and built is not affordable to them, not affordable to their families, not affordable to their communities. Part of that has to do with, not all of it, but part of it has to do with the way we calculate area median income, AMI. Right now, AMI is very distorted because it includes suburban counties. Westchester is mixed in with uh, New York City's AMI, which distorts the income bans when we're negotiating these projects. And so one of the things that I think is really important is pushing deeper on affordability, though again, it's project by project. And I think that you've seen uh, real support for Councilmember Salamanca's bill on the 15% set aside for homeless individuals and in trying to help decrease the homeless population and require housing in uh, rezonings and in new applications. There are a variety of strategies we have to look at, but I, I have to look at what the public advocate said and at his bill to give a real comment on it. Go ahead, if you want to finish, go ahead, keep going. Well, I mean, but do you agree there's been an adverse impact in terms of a racial impact from the I think it's community. I think it's community by community. I mean, I think I don't want to generalize or stereotype certain communities. You know, there are certain communities uh, and council districts that are overwhelmingly white. There are certain communities that are overwhelmingly African American. There are certain communities that are pretty mixed. Uh, it depends on where you go in the city. So. Um, we have to sort of speak more specifically about an individual uh, neighborhood wide rezoning as it relates to if that has been the effect. I do think that there has been um, a fair point that's been made, which is so many of these rezonings have been predominantly in communities of color. I believe that Councilmember uh, Lander's upcoming rezoning in Gowanus is one that I think has some community support. It needs to be tinkered with a bit, but he's had a multi-year process leading up to the rezoning, which I think has diffused some, not all, of the fear surrounding that rezoning. And that might be a template of what we, what we should do in the future for other neighborhood, neighborhood wide rezonings. Who's next? Yes, sir. Yes. Hi, uh, Eli James, voting in the dark. Oh yeah, we met outside of Bushwick Park. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I have a question about voter yes. Turnout. Yes. Um, I think this is complicated in some ways. And what I mean by that is every eligible voter gets the voting guide mailed to them. So they should know when the election is and who the candidates are for every New York City election. Um, uh, you know, do all voters look at it and read it? No, I wish they did. Uh, I remember when I ran for council, I spent a lot of time figuring out what was going to be in that book when voters saw it. Uh, I think that's one thing we do right now. But the Board of Elections does not inspire any level of confidence for voters across New York City. They are an embarrassment. Mike Ryan should resign. I said that uh, last year on primary day in September when it was a disaster on election day. And we've seen since then through some great reporting, especially from Courtney Gross at New York One, on the conflict of interest, I believe that he's been involved with on voting machines. And so when you have a system that is in the news every single day that is supposed to administer and run elections that does not inspire confidence in voters, it may decrease voter participation in some way. Are there more things that we can do uh, to get voters to participate? Yes, though we, I think actually the most important thing is having candidates that inspire people in some ways uh, we, what we saw in last year's election in the uh, September uh, uh, primary elections across the state, a threefold increase in turnout from the previous 2014 primary season. So we went from, I think, 600,000 voters who participated in the primaries in 2014 to, I think, 1.7 million people or something like that uh, in New York City uh, that participated. So it, it shows that if you have 
activity on the ballot, if you have more people who are running, who are spreading the message, more people turn out. The council has been a leader. Councilman Rosenthal worked with former council member Ignizio on doing student voter registration across schools in New York City. That's an issue that the council cares about. I, Language access, Councilmember Traeger has worked on uh, making sure that we have more interpreters at the polls, even though the Board of Elections was saying uh, just a month ago that they were trying to turn us down and not letting interpreters inside the polling sites. The BOE is a big problem, and there are some bills at the state level that would reform the governance structure of the Board of Elections. I believe that Senator Kruger has a bill that would change the way the Board of Elections is set up, where you would need to professionalize it. Uh, on who the executive director and the top staff are. We had a vote on three new Board of Elections commissioners a couple of months ago from the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Yes, Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. And for the first time ever, we had a public vote that had never been done before at the council. And we had them fill out a questionnaire asking them about certain reforms they would agree to. So there's a lot to do in this area. Advertising, should we do it? Sure, but I think it goes a lot I think it goes beyond advertising in some way. You need a multi-pronged approach to tackle this issue and increase voter turnout. And just for quick note, the, the CFB mailer that goes out, I, I know some experience, it doesn't always get there in time. And sometimes, as you know, information in it can be wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think the CFB had a mistake last election cycle, uh, which um, when we make mistakes, the CFB comes after us. When they make mistakes, Sorry, you know, uh, we screwed up. Uh, so, you know, we contacted them after that mistake happened and said, what are you doing here? And you're right. Though most of the time, uh, hopefully the information that is included and that goes out is done in a timely manner and done in an accurate manner. Speaker, actually your investment in making our schools more accessible. Come over, actually, speak in the mic. Yes, uh, actually the council under our speaker's leadership uh, prioritize uh, making our schools more accessible. There was a $750 million uh, uh, increase in our capital plan for schools that actually, of course, number one, help our kids and staff, but also actually has added benefit of helping voters. Because uh, BOE uses many of our public schools as poll sites, many of them are not accessible. Ramps and whatnot. So actually, this will actually also uh, deal with. So we're doing everything from our end, uh, but I agree that the speaker's right that the state needs to modify how the board is structured. And we need more early voting sites. I think the mayor has been correct in calling for 100 voting sites instead of, I think, 39 is what the BOE announced. 38. What was it? 38. Um, mm -hmm. they, they should have more. The city offered up money for them. They said no. Uh, it's like Groundhog Day at the Board of Elections. Yoav? Um, Nothing. If, if you could just uh, refresh my memory, was, was that a concept that, that, you, that you approved of in, in, in theory? Or? I don't really know what it means. I mean, I, I don't really understand it. I think, I think what the mayor was trying to say um, was that he wanted buildings that were more green, energy efficient, and sustainable. And one of the ways to do that was to not use the materials that he outlined in his proposal. I think it's a little more complicated than that. I think it depends on technology. I think it depends on the, the advancement of technology and how those systems are changing. Um, so I, I, he hasn't spoken to me about it. I don't know if there's been a staff to staff conversation, but he hasn't spoken to me about it. Yes, sir. Oh yes, good to see you, Alex. Okay. I don't know what that means. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means. I mean, I think that um, students of color in New York City um, face um, barriers. And you saw the package of bills that we're passing today on sports and athletics and wanting people to have equal access. We have a 
deep history of segregation in our city, and we still have segregated schools in our city today. So I don't know what that refers to. I think that these things need to be handled in a thoughtful, um, culturally sensitive way that respects all communities and that works towards integration of all young people being able to learn together and work together with reconciliation and understanding, and that's what we should be talking about. I think the SHSAT issue is one that I've spoken a lot about in the past, and I think when we talk about SHSAT, we have to talk about the entire pipeline. We have to talk about uh, elementary schools and middle schools. You have to talk about uh, screen schools. You have to talk about all of the issues that exist throughout the entire system. I've said I don't believe that the current test on its own should be the single way that people get into schools, that, um, in, the, in the specialized high schools, that we should, most, we should use multiple measures, class rank, grade point average, potentially maybe some type of test, but it needs to be done in a way that gathers input from stakeholders. We may want to create additional schools, but to have this conversation, you can't just focus on the test on its own. You have to talk about the entire system and the problems that plague the entire system so that all young people are prepared and ready uh, when they're entering high school. But I don't think that a single test is an appropriate measure. No one takes a single test to get into Harvard or Princeton or Yale, and so we should move away from that. But I think these issues are complicated, and it's important that we handle it in a way that it doesn't feel to any one community that we're minimizing them or disrespecting them. So many of the uh, Asian uh, young people and students that make it into these specialized high schools are from low-income immigrant families and communities who have worked really hard and sacrificed for those children to be able to get into the school. It's been a, a source of pride for them. I think we can move to a fair system while not demonizing those families and the hard work and the savings and the time they've put in to helping their children get a good education. I think it's important that we do implicit bias training. I think that's an important thing. We're doing it at the police department. Uh, it's an important thing to do to understand what our implicit biases are. And I'm proud that the chancellor, right when he became chancellor, started talking about segregation, not calling it diversity, but actually using the word segregation and talking about uh, our school system. So um, I think it's important to speak honestly and openly and sometimes in an unvarnished but sensitive way about these issues. And I think the chancellor has been doing that. Yes. Uh, talking about the Tell me your name. Clayton. Oh, Clayton from the Daily News. Good to see you. Yeah. I would think that the number is lower than that. Sorry, I think I think the number is the the drop is is higher than that, um, given the impact we've seen on the industry and the upheaval. Uh, I think that you probably need another look. And given uh, Brian Rosenthal's amazing investigative journalism at the Times and all of the pieces that have come out in the last two weeks, I think that uh, we've seen some real problems at the Taxi and Limousine Commission on being the watchdog and the regulatory authority uh, looking at these issues. So was that number from them, from the TLC? Uh, that number was from a commission, or a study that they commissioned. The so, so we should probably look at it. Noah? No, because we're still looking at it, and we're having, on, I don't know if it's been uh, noticed yet, but on, Mar on May, June, I'm sorry, on June 24th, we're having a joint hearing of the Transportation Committee and the Oversight and Investigations Committee looking at 
an issue that we've been studying since November of last year. Brian Rosenthal reported in one of his follow-up pieces that the Oversight and Investigations Committee uh, Division at the Council, our unit, had sent a very, I think it was a 13-page letter to the TLC asking for all sorts of issues that came up in the Times investigative piece. So we're having a hearing, a joint hearing on that. I'm really proud that an issue that the previous council wasn't able to land the plane on and creating some regulations on for hire vehicles, we did in my first year as speaker in the first year of this new council. We passed all sorts of legislation related to uh, helping to protect drivers. There, there's, there will always be more work to do. I'm committed to helping as many drivers. The, the epidemic of suicides because of the economic turmoil and upheaval in the industry is heartbreaking and tragic and awful. I met with family members last summer uh, who were affected by some of those suicides. It's terrible. If there's more work to do, we will do it. Though, again, um, we had been asking some of these issues of the TLC long before any of this became public, and we were being stonewalled by them. They weren't responding to us. So I'm glad that Brian Rosenthal was able to get further information through his investigative reporting, and we'll continue to look at these issues. Yes. Hi. Oh, cool. Well, um, I am an animal lover. Um, I, when I was growing up, I never thought about being an elected official involved in politics. I wanted to be a veterinarian or a zoologist. Um, that's what I wanted to be when I was a child. And so I had lots of animals growing up. I had um, birds and I had cats and I had a rabbit, I had a pigeon. I had all sorts of uh, animals growing up. And so um, I really believe that we need to be a more humane society. And one of the measures of that is how we treat animals. And for me, this was a cruelty issue that there are alternatives to fur. There are more ethical products that can be used that don't involve the unnecessary, the unnecessary killing of animals. You know, these fur farms, many of the animals, their feet never touch the ground. They're raised just for their fur. Um, and uh, the trapping that's done of these animals is so brutal and horrific and inhumane. So for me, um, I thought that we could become a more humane city, and I still think we can be. You've seen further regulation all across Europe. You saw Los Angeles and San Francisco ban fur. I believe the California State Assembly passed a bill uh, earlier this week or last week on moving forward a statewide proposal on banning the sale of fur. There's a lot for us to do. And one of the things that I'm proud of, and it's okay, it didn't get a lot of press at the time. I wasn't speaker, but when I was chair of the health committee, um, I passed a series of bills related to animals requiring sprink sprinklers in pet stores, working with former council member Crowley on not allowing puppy and kitten mills to sell puppies and kittens in New York City, um, doing all sorts of things. Uh, we're pushing for more funding. We got more funding. One of my missions, it didn't get any press, but I got $3 million more for the shelter system in New York City to move towards being a, a no-kill shelter system in the city. So I'm an animal lover, and for me, this aligns with that. I do think we have to think carefully about the job factor, and I'm open to doing that, figuring out a phase-in period, figuring out if there's a way to do some job training for folks that already have these great skills. And I, I was actually moved by some of the furriers and their testimony and this has been their entire life and this is all they know and how would this affect them I would want to do it in a way that that kept them in mind because while we're trying to be uh, less cruel towards animals we also want to do this in a more humane way to the workers as well so this needs to be done in a carefully thought out sensitive way I'm open to doing that as it moves to the legislative process but uh, I, I I mean I maybe I should have thought more about this before I introduced it, because I didn't realize the amount of pushback that there would be, 
And I really just did it because it, I felt like it was the right thing to do in my heart in many ways. The issue just spoke to me. And that's why I did it. And that's why I introduced it. And that's why I wanted to have a hearing on it to have the conversation around it. Uh, Joe? Do you have the votes to pass it right now? Or I haven't checked. What sort of, what are you doing right we now? don't vote count until we're about to pass it. Have I asked any of you? No. I haven't asked any of We literally haven't even looked at it yet. We had the hearing. Well, I haven't gone back and met with staff about it in the aftermath. We're doing a lot here, as you can tell by the number of bills we're passing today, and we're in the middle of the budget process. Uh, but as I just um, answered, I want to do this in a thoughtful, sensitive way. Uh, and I want to do it to protect animals, but at the same time, I also am sensitive to workers and figuring out a way to do it uh, that gives potentially a, ver a long phase in period, uh, job training, um, anything we can do to help move towards uh, more ethical manufacturing of products. I'm open to figuring out legally what we're allowed to do. Last yes. Question. Go ahead. Um, yes. Well, it's already being done. Uh, Do Donna Televersace and Donna Karen and Diane von Furstenberg, and the list goes on. Prada announced last week they're going to go for free next year. It's already happening. Tommy Hilfiger, I mean, name any major fashion, Michael Kors, name any major fashion designer around the world. They've moved away from fur, and they moved away from fur. When you speak to them, they'll tell you that they moved away as once they got the facts, once they learned how fur is manufactured, they didn't feel like it was the right thing to do anymore, and they still have successful businesses. I think they are different than fur. Furriers. Furriers specialize only in fur. Uh, they don't have sort of the diverse product line that some of these other companies have. Uh, so there are some unique sensitivities we would have we would have to have in looking at some of these small furriers. And, and, and again, I still feel like this is the right thing to do, but I was moved by the testimony uh, by some of the small furriers and the small businesses in being able to handle this in a sensitive way towards them and let this phase out and give them support while we do that. Okay. Noah? Yeah. I think Vin had an article about it uh, last night. He's the one that broke the report on it and reached out. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, it, it sounds good uh, to me. Um, I mean, everything goes through the legislative process, so I don't want to prejudge it, but it's in line with breaking the car culture. It's in line with making our streets safer. It's in line with moving towards a more pedestrian and cyclist-friendly city uh, and all the reasons why I support that. Again, it will go through the process. I think you've seen our transportation chair be very supportive of these type of things, and and um, it sounds like a good thing. And uh, I haven't had a conversation yet with Councilmember Menchaca. I'm sure I'll do that, uh, but I have no opposition to it. Do we have a hearing scheduled? No. We're in the middle of budget time, so it's sort of mucked things up a little bit legislatively. We've been so focused on that. Bridget? Last question. Uh, so related to budget, you are moving into the final week of negotiation. At the same time, you're going to be talking about the Supreme Court ruling on the The mayor and I have not had a conversation about anything specifically budget related in the last uh, few weeks. There has been many conversations at the staff level from Latanya McKinney, uh, our director of finance with uh, Melanie Hartzog, the OMB uh, budget director, and uh, Jason Goldman, my chief of staff, with Emma Wolf, his chief of staff. So there have been a lot of conversations going back and forth. We just finished budget hearings uh, last week. I am very proud that I think every year since I've been in the council, even before I was speaker, I've sat through every single hour of public budget testimony. I was, I think, there for six or seven hours last week listening to the public, which was very, very helpful to hear from them and what their priorities are. Um, you know, the mayor's running for president. 
I don't know what to say. I mean, he's running for president. He's going to run for president. I heard that. I'm not, yeah, it's not me breaking news. I mean, what I'm saying is, like, what, what, what can I do? I mean, I, one of the lessons I learned in recovery and in sobriety, one of the key lessons is uh, uh, I am powerless over alcohol and it made my life unmanageable. I am powerless over other people. I'm powerless over Bill de Blasio. Hopefully it doesn't make my life unmanageable, uh, but I am powerless over other people. Uh, and so I can't control what they do. I am focused on this job. If I need to speak to the mayor, he picks up my calls. Uh, if I need to speak with him, he answers. Uh, I was at a, uh, I think you were there, Bridget. I was reading to toddlers on the steps of City Hall today on library funding. I was with Councilmember Reynoso where I met Eli outside of a park in Bushwick two weeks ago calling on further sanitation funding. Uh, we're having all sorts of conversations through the budget negotiating team and led by our finance chair on uh, what we're doing in the budget. So I am laser focused. I mean, these three folks are on the budget negotiating team. They will tell you we are spending hours and hours and hours pouring over documents and forecasts over what it looks like. That's what I'm focused on. If I need the mayor, I will call him. If he's going to be in Nevada, hopefully he picks up my phone when he's on the Sunset Strip, when he's on the Las Vegas Strip, we'll see what's going to happen. But uh, I, I, you know, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a tough budget negotiation. I mean, I don't think this budget negotiation is going to wrap up quickly. And I've said before that we have till July 1st. I'm in no hurry. There's a lot of things that need to get done. Library funding, budget reserves, education funding, social workers for bridging the gap in education. I mean, there's a lot of funding of things that the council cares about. Um, I want more savings and efficiencies than what the PEG gave us. There's a lot of stuff we need to do. And at this point, negotiations are just about to begin because we just finished our budget hearings last week. But I'm in no rush, no hurry to get it done. Um, uh, the Pride Parade is on the last day of the month, so I will be here until the last day of the month uh, with nowhere to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's plenty of time to negotiate. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon that we'll come to an agreement. And it's going to be a, a good conversation inside the council about what we really need. Anyone else before I go? Okay, we're going to finish with uh, these three, Jen. Rich, hmm? Jeff, sorry, tell me you, you go first. Oh, okay. Good to see you. Hi. Oh, Julianne Cuba. Good. Uh, good. Nice to meet you. I followed your reporting for a long time. The Councilman Rodriguez's bill yeah. on the Vision Zero checklist. Yeah. No, we got to, I think, a good place with the administration, I assume, at the end. If we didn't, we're passing the bill and it's going to pass. So I don't know if the mayor's never vetoed anything. Maybe he'll veto this. I don't know. It's going to pass overwhelmingly, proudly. Rich. You're baiting me, Rich. <laughs> I think it is. You say it's going to be difficult negotiation. How much more difficult does it become with the mayor campaigning in and out of town? And it seems usually much smoother than it is with the city hall. Last year, negotiations were tough until the very last minute, and he was here. Um, uh, these folks will tell you how difficult it was last year. Uh, so. He's away. Whenever I call him, he picks up. Or if he doesn't pick up, he calls me back within a couple of hours. So I, I feel like he's been available to me. There's been a lot of conversation at the staff level. I think it's very hard to run for president when you're mayor of New York City because this is the job of mayor is such a 24-7 challenging job. Now, a lot of it, I guess, can be done remotely, but some things can't be done remotely. Sometimes there are things that happen in New York City that you have to be present for. And we're going to see if those things crop up over the course of this campaign, uh, if he's away in these early primary states when something happens here. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I'm powerless over other people. If you were issued and you were running for president one day, Rich. How did you, Rich. How did you handle budget negotiations? Jeff Mays. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. 
we, we haven't even had sat down and have a conversation about it after the hearing. So I haven't, I've been so busy on budget stuff and on other legislation that we're passing today that I haven't even sat down with the legislative team and division to have a conversation about the testimony that was given, um, what it would look like. I haven't lobbied a single council member on it. So it just, we had the hearing, which I thought was really helpful to hear from both sides. It was educational for me. I don't know. Um, we'll see. I mean, I, I, I do think that um, I want to make sure it's done in a really sensitive way to, to the people who work in the industry. Um, I mean, I don't think they're going to want any type of bill. But if, if we have a bill, I want to make sure it's done in a way that is sensitive to them and gives time for a phase in, potentially creates a uh, job retraining or workforce related program because they already have fashion skills where they're making garments and I think there are 180,000 uh, fashion jobs in New York City and I think you know half a percentage of them are fur related jobs so there 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 is plenty of other work but again we would need to set it up in a way we would need to set that up in a way that would work for them and to work with them to know what that would look like um, so I'm open to having that conversation, but I haven't sat back down. I hadn't had a single conversation with the staff here since the hearing. I've been so busy. Rich, I wasn't trying to avoid your question. I just, I don't know what, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think I've said what I, I think you know what I, I think you know how I feel. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.